Uh, thanks to John, I guess. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm really glad being in an electrification program that I'm not pretending to be an electrification engineer because uh, John's covered it in a great... Um, Egypt is a program um, ultimately delivers uh, 170 SDK of electrification. That's our primary output. Um, but today uh, we're going to talk about um, some other things. Um, my name's Neil Hamilton. I'm a senior project engineer for TRAC within Network Rail. Um, within the, the Egypt organisation, um, based in Glasgow. Um, I've been for a good number of years, as I say, track engineer working in an electrification programme, and we'll take you through um, some of the work that we've delivered um, in the last year um, with the Alliance, um, and we'll talk about uh, what we're going to deliver um, during our Queen Street blockade this year. Um, if you haven't seen it on the news, I'm sure you will soon. Yeah. <coughs> so just what we're going to talk about, um, who we are, um, the Egypt program, the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Program, um, what we're about, um, where we're working, and uh, when we plan to deliver that work. Um, specifically about um, some of the challenges we've got in the work that we're going to deliver uh, in the summer of this year, uh, and in fact starting in three weeks' time um, for 20 weeks. Um, we are replacing uh, a kilometre of double track slab in the high level tunnel um, and remodelling the station to accommodate the longer trains. Um, Graham will pick up the second half of the presentation and take you through some of the challenges that, that come with that programme um, and in the environment that we're working. So a bit about who we are, um, the Alliance um, in sort of network rail fashion, um, we've got um, uh, the Alliance made up from Morgan Sindel from a civils and infrastructure perspective, um, Castain deliver the, the electrification element. Um, Network Rail are the, the owner participant and um, together we, we make up uh, the Alliance. That the Alliance deliver a, one of the key outputs for Egypt. There are a host of others that are delivered in a more conventional manner, um, client contractor relationship. Um, we can't do it alone, I guess. Uh, Morgan Sindel are supported um, for by designers um, Jacobs um, and, and Babcock for track delivery. Um, Castain have a number of um, support and acts, uh, Alstom, Sistra for overhead line design um, and, and Babcock in the delivery arm. Um, to say that that does the organisation justice, um, it doesn't even go close. There are probably another 20 or 30 organisations that support the Alliance um, on a daily basis. So 2015 um, has been a big year for, for electrification. Um, a bit of the geography I guess. Um, we electrify from Glasgow in the west. Um, the main line runs um, sort of this route uh, along through Falkirk, through Linlithgow, finishing uh, in Edinburgh. We, the scheme actually ties into the original Andrew Bathgate electrification at the end. Um, but we're going to focus our efforts on what we've, what we've been delivering. So this year, um, Transport Scotland will introduce new electric trains on this route. Um, we are working, or have been working through the year to extend the platforms to accommodate the eight car trains, um, to reconstruct all the overbridges for, for electrification. Um, there are, I think, half a dozen platforms to be extended, um, with Queen Street being the sort of final part of that jigsaw. Some of the challenges that John alluded to in uh, parapets and, and clearances, uh, that's something that we tackle on a daily basis. Uh, one of our biggest problems, and, and a token overhead line mast from the track engineer. <coughs> so that was 2015 in a, in a bit of a whirlwind. Um, 2016 is a massive year for us. We, we commissioned um, in December of this year um, the first phase of electrification um, from Edinburgh to Glasgow. Um, that is an exceptional challenge from here. Um, I think we're something like 2,500 foundations in the ground. Um, an awful lot, a uh, few hundred masts and, and wire runs are now in place. Um, but today we're, we're going to talk in a bit more detail about what we're going to deliver at Queen Street. Um, to enable the work, to enable the blockade in the Queen Street high level station, um, the 20 week duration, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, um, requires extensive diversionary, diversionary services. Um, ScotRail worked with Network Rail to identify an opportunity um, to provide some new infrastructure on the route um, to allow them to run um, a kind of less disruptive disru diversionary service. Um, this photograph um, goes on, shows that the new connecting line that we installed um, to connect um, two parts of the network, which allow then the diversionary services to run um, from the ENG and reduce the disruption to the passengers. 
So what we're going to deliver this year uh, is uh, starting in three weeks' time, 20th of March, start of the, the blockade. Um, primarily um, the incline drainage and, and plain line. And just to explain a bit about the, the tunnel and the slab track, we'll talk in a bit more detail. Um, we're remodelling the throat um, extensively to accommodate the longer trains in Queen Street. Um, seven cars initially, um, with an eight-car alteration that comes with the station redevelopment in 2018. Um, you'll appreciate in doing all of those things require extensive signalling alterations. Uh, and in fact, there's nothing really left of the station, um, or the operational part of the station by the time we're finished. And in, in the mix, um, electrification, the programmes overlap. Um, when we're in working in Queen Street this year, we need to um, construct all the electrification, get the conductor bars up, get everything in through the tunnel at the same time as we're there. So a bit about the work at Queen Street. Um, this is a, a few photos. This is the top of the tunnel looking down into the station. Um, we re replaced the existing slab track. A view of the existing station area. Everything you can see in that photo um, is effectively ripped up and replaced. The entire track layout, all the platform ends, all the signals, um, all the platform furniture, everything changes. Um, we use um, BIM. Um, Probably not as good as we should, but we're, we're trying to use it um, to, to help us work through some of our clashes, some of our IDC issues and we've got in the station. <coughs> That's the existing layout um, today. Uh, seven platforms, uh, one relatively short, the remainder are sort of five, six uh, and a long platform on seven. Um, so to accommodate the seven car trains um, for the end of this year, um, the layout changes like that. So um, the entire track layout has changed. Um, all of the signal positions are all moved. Um, the hatched area and the, the sort of red lines show the extent of the platform alterations. Um, that gives us a, a seven car standage um, in, the, in the short term. So a bit about the tunnel. Um, Queen Street High Level Tunnel has been on Network Rail's debate um, in terms of what we can do with the slab. Um, for as long as I can remember, and I'm sure the people that are in the audience um, that are an awful lot older than me um, can remember the Queen Street High Level Slab um, uh, and all the problems that come with it. Um, we, uh, three years ago, commissioned uh, a piece of work to, to make an assessment of the High Level Slab, knowing that, that Egypt as a programme was going to come along and require extensive disruption to the station um, that would afford an opportunity um, to deliver um, potential replacement <coughs> of the slab. Now at that time we didn't necessarily understand the extent of the problem um, so we wanted to, to do a bit more detailed investigation into some of the problems in this lab um, to work out whether or not there were any um, short-term measures that would give us um, the necessary output. So Queen Street High Level Tunnel is a kilometre long. It has two crossovers in this lab um, at the bottom end. Um, originally slabbed, uh, changed from ballasted track <coughs> Uh, I think in the late 60s or early 70s, um, replaced with a ladder unit. So the original replacement of the slab was done with um, precast ladder sections, um, with the S and C um, subsequently being replaced with a standard concrete bearer um, cast into our mass filled concrete. Um, as you'll appreciate, um, some of the challenges with maintaining some of those things um, are of have caused a few issues over the years. So what we did is we, we took all the existing information, we made an assessment of all the historical um, documents that are available for this lab. Uh, we undertook extensive investigation. Each of those represents a core um, through the slab into the base material to, to help us work out um, why we're having so many problems. Um, to give you uh, an insight into some of the challenges in, in Queen Street, um, I've got some uh, interesting pictures. Um, that, believe it or not, <laughs> um, used to be a housing. Um, that plastic cup, I think, is holding gauge at the moment. Um, uh, you can see the environment is, is pretty terrible. What I'll say, in the defence defense of those that are looking after this lab today, some of these photos are, are nearly 20 years old now, so there's an awful lot of work gone in uh, since these photographs were taken um, to, make, to, to sustain this lab. Um, in its current state. Well, so we, we mentioned a bit about the ladder track sections. Um, you can see 
That there is the end of a ladder track unit. It has a, d a housing um, fastened uh, uh, directly, so the rail sits directly on top of the ladder. Um, the ladder units are uh, precast uh, with a mass filled concrete behind them. Um, some of the issues you can see there, um, the ladder in this case is totally debonded from the rest of the mass concrete, um, causing no end of trouble. A uh, similar scenario, I guess, that, that, that I don't know if you can see from the photo, but that is a hole in the mass concrete um, with water sitting in the bottom of the hole. That hole goes all the way to the rock at the bottom, um, where it's fairly evident that there is no bond um, between the, the top slab or the base slab in this case um, and the actual natural rock in there. One of the key themes you'll see from all the photographs is that water um, appears in almost every one. Um, just the same as whoever boot that is appears in every one as well. <laughs> uh, this is a, one of the hedgehog sections. So what happened over time is the ladder, the ladder units became unmaintainable. Um, over, the, over time, um, I think to date, 55% of the slab has been replaced. Um, so the original ladder units have been taken out and replaced with either, in this case, um, a kind of hedgehog arrangement um, so the, the ladder comes out, you break out all the existing mass concrete um, fitted with sort of hedgehog sleepers and then backfill the concrete. Um, the problem with that is, as we'll see, um, it was done in short sections, it was done in short positions under an awful lot of pressure. Um, so the quality that, that we ended up getting is uh, pretty poor. Um, water is the theme. There are two channels, two channels run down the outside of the slab and, and they are the, the primary means of draining um, the system. The problem being that um, through uh, a lot of litter ingress in the tunnel um, uh, and a lot of issues with uh, material um, coming through the lining, um, the, the channels are just um, not really suited. Um, there are a lot of cases where the channels back up uh, and water floods out onto the top <coughs> of the slab, uh, causing no end of trouble. And there's that wee boot again. Uh, other issues in the tunnel, um, I think it's probably fair to say there's an awful lot of tunnels in the UK network that look just like that. Um, we've, we're undertaking an exercise to try and work out what some of this spaghetti is. Um, don't ask me the last person who flicked that switch. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably lying in the muck. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, ultimately, our investigations have shown I think there are a dozen cables that need to remain. Um, in that spaghetti. Um, so when we finish, um, the, the entire system will be replaced. Uh, we clean the wall to wall, if you like, so all of that will come off, new cable tray will go on. And as I say, the final scheme requires 12 cables uh, mixed between the up and down line sides. Um, so we'll get a, a far more maintainable product, ultimately, by the time we actually come out the other end. Some of the Catastrophic problems, I guess, um, when you've got your slab moving around under your feet. Um, yeah, again, a kind of historical photo, you can see there's a whole host of issues going on there, um, not least of which the broken rail, um, all this sort of headwear um, problems. Uh, and again, our, our favourite theme here, um, muck and water um, causing the end of trouble um, on the top of the slab. One of the one of the means we've been able to um, sustain um, the track slab in its current form is actually to take out or, or make the existing system redundant. Um, in this case, um, the ladder is doweled into the base slab. Uh, we then make the housing redundant, um, and we cut a pocket um, for a, a viper panel viper base plate, um, quite a shallow depth um, that we can then cast in, uh, holding down arrangements. That's been used in a whole host of cases in the tunnel um, to, look, to deal with the worst sections. So one of the things we did to try and understand um, the problems in the tunnel and the reasons why um, we have some of the problems that we do, um, we looked back through uh, some of Network Rail's records. That's a hell of a task, let me tell you. One of the things we did find was this paper um, from our former president, uh, 1982, um, president uh, and chief civil engineer. I thought that was very pertinent. So this is a paper on pack track. It goes on to explain um, 
network rails development of slab track systems. Um, there are some, uh, some excellent stuff in here about some of the lessons they learned when they were doing it. Um, I, I extracted a couple of paragraphs that I thought that were pertinent. There are quite a lot of good stuff in the, in the actual real document. So this is an extract from the section that reflection on what was happening in Queen Street High Level Tunnel when they did the original slab track. You can read that for yourself. The, uh, the themes of water, mud, slurry, rushed nature of the work, water trapped under the ladder. Um, so that resulted in um, extensive replacement, as I said, over the years since, since uh, the 70s when it was installed. Um, they had uh, already started to replace it. <laughs> so, uh, I think, it, it, in summary, I think I think he got it pretty right. You know, I think they did the best they could with what they had. Um, what has been really important for us is to learn some of those lessons. Um, we're under no no illusion um, of the the size of the challenge that we are facing when we go into Queen Street. Um, not least of which all the issues that's been picked up uh, in the previous report. I think the time we wrote that report in 82, they'd already replaced 70 metres of the ladder as a result of some of those issues that they've picked up. Um, and I say we've gone on to replace 55% of it. <coughs> so in understanding what we could do, um, it, it's important for us to to determine whether or not there was a way for us to reduce the impact of the disruption. So one of the, the things that we wanted to do was to try and understand better um, the size of the problem. We knew um, from the track quality, um, I guess you'd be forgiven to think that the slab track would be this section. Um, <laughs> in reality, the tunnel is in that bit. <laughs> so anybody who is familiar with the trace, smoother the better. Um, the slab track in this case um, has a whole host of problems, um, I guess pretty well um, picked out, not least of which all the gauge variations. You think, how does that happen in slab track? Let me tell you, it does. <laughs> um, so we, we went on to investigate some of the problems. I think it's, I think it's David alluded to, we collect an awful lot of data. Network Rail has... Um, all the records, I think we were able to get nearly 20 years of track recording information to try and work out whether or not there was a trend in deterioration that it was something that we could stem um, to, to give us a shorter term solution. Um, in reality, when we started to look, um, actually the areas that we thought were good um, but appear good on the trace and in fact appear good um, just in ba basic geometry terms turned out to be some of the worst. Um, so we implemented a system to, to monitor um, a, a, n a number of things, a number of scenarios. Um, we were concerned that the whole base slab was moving around within the tunnel because of the water that was flowing in the invert. Um, we were then also concerned, as you can see from the photographs, that the, uh, the precast elements, the, the individual hedgehogs in the, or the, the precast ladder units were moving around independently from the base slab. We also had real concerns about the rail movement. Um, because of how wet the tunnel is, um, there are real challenges with attrition. Um, because it was a continuous footing, because it's so wet all the time, um, there's an awful lot of wear both in the rail foot but also in the, in the concrete itself. That's been managed over the years by um, wedging in more and more pads to make it all work. Um, but as we'll see in some of the data, that's actually proved to be um, detrimental to the system. So that was the kind of arbitrary thing that we came up with. Um, datum, uh, datum, I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, uh, came up with a system that mounted on the sort of parent slab on the outside uh, with a, a gauge uh, mounted on the, on the ladder unit to help us work out what the extent of the dynamic movement. Um, and we found some, some real surprises. Um, so we set these up in various locations in the tunnel. We picked some of the, what we thought were the best places to determine that the measure was accurate and we picked up what we, we viewed as to be some of the worst <coughs> um, and we got some surprising values out. Uh, the uh, apologies if you can't see, read these at the back, but let me explain. Uh, fif 15 millimetres rotation in the rail in the gauge, um, 30 millimetres both vertically um, are 
moving up the way, would you believe it, and also down, um, dynamic movement um, in some locations. Um, one of the areas that we did record that particular movement was actually an area that we, just, we thought was one of the best. <coughs> um, so we, we found out some real surprises. Um, so when we originally looked at the scheme to limit the amount of work that we were proposing to do, i.e. replace just the ladder units, it turns out that the bit that we thought was good, all the hedgehog areas, were actually just as bad, <laughs> unfortunately. So a bit about the technology, I guess, um, if you can call it that. Um, one of the schemes that we delivered in 2015 was the replacement or the slab tracking of the Winchcliffe Tunnel. Involved taking about a foot out the, the rock floor of the tunnel and replacing it with um, a slab track system. Um, we've selected this system. Um, I think there have been a number of presentations by, by Romberg <coughs> and by others. Um, the POR system for us um, meets all our needs. Um, we've got some substantial logistical challenges that Graham will allude to um, in his part. Um, so we've a precast element for us was, was really the way forward. So the port. Uh, uh, well, two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> yeah. That's the port slab. It works basically precast elements on the top. Um, you place it on a base slab and you cast in the section on the top. Um, dealing with the transitions, as most of them know, um, the transition from the slab to the ballasted track is where one of our main challenges are. Um, we implemented this successfully at Winchborough. It's called a V-Tras, um, again, sort of adopted from Europe. Uh, involves a, a ladder, effectively, that supports the sleepers um, on a bearing at the end of the slab. Um, I say that's been quite successful, running at 90 miles an hour with 18 million tonnes uh, on each line at Winchborough. So we're going to deploy that at Queen Street as well. <coughs> it's the general section, two independent slabs um, for the plain line. Um, with the, the poor units on top. Something a wee bit different for the SNC. One of the challenges we had was trying to determine or give us a system that was going to be suitable for Queen Street. Um, but also, uh, given the time frame, something that we could readily adopt. Um, so the system we've, we've lumped for is um, low vibration track, an LVT system. It's effectively a booted block. You can see the basics um, on here. Concrete block. In this case, it was S and C with a resilient pad and a rubber boot that separates it from the from this mass concrete. What we've done is developed a system that allows us to have a standard network rail um, crossover. In this case, mounted on these uh, concrete blocks. Um, I think we've identified that in all of the system that we need to deploy on there. I think there are some shims required for um, some of the crank plates, but the rest of it is absolutely standard. Base plate up, it's off the shelf network rail kit. Everything below that um, is, a, is an LVT system. Um, the crossovers in the tunnel are two DVS um, transition crossovers. That's a photo um, from our partner Romberg um, Walthamstow on the underground. That's an LVT system deployed um, with an LUL, um, but you can see a standard base plated pan rail connected system um, that you so a jig, if you like, to get geometry and then cast mass fill round about. In section, it looks like that. Uh, I guess key to all the success of all of this work is the provision of additional drainage that, that drains the formation. That runs through the, the centre of the S and C. Uh, and with that, I'll pass <coughs> on to Graham. Okay, thank you, Neil. Uh, yeah, my name is Graham McInnes. I'm the contractors engineer and manager for Morgan Sindel, who is the principal contractor as part of the alliance for this. Uh, now, apologies, I was planning on doing this in my finest Euro-Scottish accent. Uh, unfortunately, time constraints mean those of you who can understand Glaswegian will be fine. <laughs> I will try and uh, refrain with the profanities, but I can't uh, promise that. Okay, so Queen Street blockade, you probably heard about it in the news. It's quite a, uh, an important job in Scotland, particularly in the, the kind of central belt. Uh, we're essentially closing uh, the second busiest station in Scotland for 20 weeks, which has went down incredibly well with commuters uh, and neighbours, friends and family. Uh, but essentially what we're trying to do here 
as you can imagine, when we do shut the kind of major stations for this period of time, we need to fit in as much as we possibly can to that, almost a, if Carlsberg did blockades. So what we have here, uh, oops, press that one back there, is a kind of high level kind of uh, programme. Uh, I won't really touch on the signalling element of it, but essentially uh, 14 weeks of this is going to be uh, platform works. Uh, there's a lot of the, the main throat renewals which will be undertaken. Uh, and then uh, there'll be track renewal works as well. As I go through my presentation, uh, we'll touch on some of the high level figures. Uh, and as you see there, we're probably about seven or eight weeks within the tunnel doing the slab. Okay, so one of the kind of main issues that we have here uh, is going to be the logistics of it. Uh, now, one of the kind of key elements of it is to kind of the fact that this site is approximately two kilometres in length, uh, with 918 metres of that being the tunnel. Now, as you can imagine, a lot of the, the kind of key uh, issues that we're going to face is getting materials in and out of a, a tunnel environment. Now, if my animation works. There we go. I'm surprised at that. OK, so to the north of the station, uh, we're looking at accessing most of our on-track plant here. Uh, the problem, as you can imagine, is one way in, one way out. As we move further down towards the tunnel, uh, you'll notice that we have a kind of quite a large compound area here. Uh, now, the size of this job uh, and the amount of the kind of personnel and just the, the general workforce that we need to accommodate, uh, we'll get multiple sites along here. And as we move south towards the tunnel itself, uh, what we've got to do as well, uh, we've got to install quite a significant drainage uh, system, temporary drainage. The Cowlers Incline, which just comes down here, uh, is a 1 in 40 grade uh, with quite significant uh, water coming down there. So uh, this weekend uh, we'll be installing a cut-off train and a temporary pumping arrangement. Now initially we had hoped to uh, pump it into the canal. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they, they don't deem the water as, uh, as being appropriate to put into the canal, despite it being actually cleaner than the canal and with <laughs> less <laughs> trolleys. Uh, however, uh, SEPA have deemed it. Anyway, I won't dwell on that point. <laughs> okay, so as we come further south again, uh, we're looking at kind of uh, more compounds and cabin arrangements. The biggest issue actually that we're facing is uh, parking for uh, suppliers. Uh, I've got my pass, so I'm okay. <laughs> now, as we come into here, we're, we're actually above the tunnel now, uh, and one of the kind of main issues we're going to face is running concrete and grout into the tunnel itself. In terms of material out, we will take that out with the kind of the, the north and south portals, uh, and we can deal with that uh, via trains that will remove that to uh, Miller Hill, which is on the east coast of Scotland. However, uh, concrete in and out, so we'll be using existing shafts, and we'll start to pump uh, concrete down into remixers, which will then shuttle run up and down this, uh, the tunnel. There's the other air shaft there, uh, right next to the bus station, for those of you who know Glasgow. And there's the, the station itself. Uh, so significant amount of works in the vicinity. Uh, the low level station will still be operable. So essentially, uh, as Neil alluded to earlier on, the, the diversionary works within this uh, uh, means that the, 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 the upper station has been diverted into the, the, the low level. Uh, so we still have re relevant kind of or similar amounts of passengers, uh, which we still need to kind of manage and maintain uh, right where we are trying to access our plant. So it's quite a logistical kind of issue here, uh, and there is quite a, a significant interface. Okay, so in terms of the, the, the main kind of station, uh, we're looking at remodelling the throat. Now, Neil's touched upon the, the purpose of this. Uh, obviously, we're extending to seven cars as part of kind of key output one. Uh, long term, we are looking at running in several platforms at eight cars. Uh, so essentially, that's a, a full remodelling of the throat, which you can see here. Okay, so uh, while we're demolishing part of the platforms, uh, we had initially looked at uh, undertaking uh, a precast arrangement purely on the basis that time was of a, a, a significant constraint. Now, with the tunnel works coming into our kind of package, it then meant that we, we weren't able to run the same amount of RRBs and weren't able to bring in precast uh, through the, the, the tunnel because this is effectively landlocked now. Uh, so what we've done is we've uh, resorted to the good old-fashioned uh, traditional front wall uh, construction uh, and we'll flood it with brickies, essentially. OK, so uh, this is just a couple of uh, sections showing the kind of cut uh, and fill. A significant amount of material is going to come out of this station uh, and that will need to run uh, not via trains but uh, via road, which is causing uh, obviously kind of quite a, an impact. 
for those of you who are kind of a of with Queen Street Station, it is in the centre of Glasgow, right on George Square, uh, which is causing kind of, uh, as you can imagine, quite a bit of havoc, especially with Glasgow City Council, because they'll have to turn off their bus lanes. Okay, so uh, just touching on some of the other elements here, this is the kind of new signal gantry that's going in. Uh, it's quite a significant uh, bit of steel uh, that will span right across uh, the, the main throat itself. And this is just going into the tunnel here. So Neil showed a slide earlier on, which just shows the, uh, the, the new slab track uh, arrangement that's coming in there. Uh, one of the biggest issues we actually face in here, as you'll note, that with the reference to the dowels, is the, uh, the pore water pressure. Uh, we, we have uh, quite a lot of piezometers in there at the minute, and the, the readings that we're getting are inc incredibly significant. Uh, there's obviously concerns of kind of artesian water, etc. Uh, now, the dowels themselves, because of the type of system that it is, is to maintain that bond down. And there's some kind of uh, further sections, and uh, just the, the cross track drainage as we go in here. Okay, so as you can imagine, with any kind of tunnel job, uh, the significant amounts of uh, design has went into this in advance. So part of the works that we had to do there was do a full kind of uh, tunnel monitoring system and a full tunnel analysis, so that when we put our workforce into this tunnel, uh, we are confident uh, that we are not putting them at risk. So essentially, what we've done is uh, we've modelled it, and from that model, we've then obtained trigger levels which all kind of uh, ties into our evacuation strategies uh, and uh, all tunnel management strategies. And this is just a kind of diagram of that there. And there's kind of all the kind of uh, the, the pressure spots that we're, we're looking at. Okay, now I'm running short of time, so I'm going to skip. Or am I? Am I okay? Um, you'll have another uh, four or five minutes because I've uh, cut short the tea break. <laughs> oh, look at that. That's me lost the audience straight away. Okay, well, this was a, a, a video, approximately two uh, minutes long, of uh, people coring into some concrete, uh, people some breaking some concrete, and an RRV lifting and moving it out of the way. So, uh, what we'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll try and skip forward once you get the kind of exciting part over and done with. The purpose of this video, though, is, is, is to to show that before we go into a blockade of this size, there is significant planning works that need to go into this. Uh, obviously, we want to ensure that down to the, well, I would say the minute, but to the hour, that we, we've planned uh, and we've worked out how long activities are going to take. So what we did is we undertook a trial. I think that was in the only sunny day last year, so uh, you see that from the blue skies. And this is effectively the methodology of what will remove the existing slab track. So in advance of the, the main blockade, we have a three-week uh, section which is going to be tracking mules. So while we're, uh, that's been undertaken to the, 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 the north of the, the station or on the incline, uh, we'll be going in there and we'll be coring down and into it. It adds a kind of twofold. Uh, it, it helps when we're actually breaking it out, but it also uh, kind of helps alleviate some of that poor water pressure uh, when, we're, when we're doing that. So this is a really exciting bit for me, the, like kind of concrete. I'm not going to ruin this for you, just, just watch. But it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but this shows the, kind of the process that we'll undertake. I'll try and skip forward. Okay, so Neil mentioned the, the, the OB POR uh, system. Uh, this is essentially a, kind of a, a visualisation of it being laid. Now, uh, we undertook uh, Winchborough Tunnel Works in the summer of last year on a 40 day blockade. Uh, it was the exact same system. Uh, and one of the benefits of undertaking that on a smaller scale was that uh, there were significant lessons learned obtained from that. These are all being fed in to the, the works at Queen Street. So we're in a kind of far happier place kind of going into it. But essentially this is just the, the showing that it's kind of the formwork being set up and the self-compacting concrete being kind of once it's been kind of uh, lined and levelled. So as I mentioned, uh, we did Winchborough in, in the summer. Uh, you can tell it's summer, can't you? It resembles uh, uh, the last days of Stalingrad, but uh, we had significant problems with water in Munchborough, uh, just essentially where it was. And uh, from, from reading back in some of the historic papers on it, it was actually down to kind of poor contractor installation. So a lot's changed since, uh, since then. Uh, that's just going into the tunnel. As you can see, the kind of, uh, that's us down at formation. We had to take quite a lot of the, the the invert out at Winchborough, I think up to about three, four hundred uh, millimetres at some points. 
and it's just going to slip through. That's, uh, that, that, that was kind of uh, probably one of the better days. Uh, it's, uh, we are expecting kind of obviously big problems with water in Queen Street just because of the, the, the incline. Uh, but obviously with the lessons learned that we had from Lynchborough, we were kind of a lot happier about how we're going to tackle that. This is the kind of the base slab uh, once it's been constructed. Uh, one of the kind of key issues, we, we'd initially set this up as a hit and miss uh, with dowels going in uh, prior to the, the, the concrete being cast. Uh, halfway through the blockade, we altered that sequence uh, just purely because of the difficulties that we had. So essentially what we've done now is uh, we've changed that it. it's going to be a continuous pour. So when you consider that Queen Street Tunnel is 918 uh, metres long on each road, uh, that's quite a significant pour. What we then did was we, we've then altered the, the, the coring of the dowels to be done on the slab itself rather than in the, the, the rock there. What, what that does is it takes kind of that off the critical path and it gives a, a lot better kind of working sequence to, to go at. Uh, that's kind of coming up towards the, the, the end where the VTRAS system is and that's the, the VTRAS itself being poured and uh, that was kind of Romberg doing the installation there. <laughs> Uh, and that's just kind of showing the kind of concrete as we kind of uh, were in with the remixers. Uh, we'll be following the same system into here. Uh, we have looked at fixed line kind of pumping of concrete, but given the environment that it is, this is actually kind of uh, a lot simpler and gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of any faults or any breakdowns with equipment. So that's the kind of uh, the POS system uh, in advance of the self-compacting concrete being laid. And that is... Uh, just before we handed back, uh, still some works to be done at that time, such as cable management, etc. Uh, but in terms of what was there previously, a significant improvement. And that's essentially, with the exception of the ballast, is the system that will be deploying uh, in Queen Street itself. And uh, this is another really exciting kind of animation, which essentially shows the linear uh, nature of the works. Uh, the dotted elements are, are coring in advance. But it, what, what it shows, though, is uh, we'll start on the upline. Uh, we'll start working from uh, the, the station itself up the incline. Uh, we'll remove uh, and then we'll start to cast the base slab uh, moving north. Uh, once we've cast that, we'll then start to land the post units. Uh, once they're lining level, we've got the strings out. We'll, we'll then look at kind of uh, casting those in place. That then gives us an upline that which we can then utilise for bringing the, uh, the train in. Once we then do that, we'll be able to then uh, excavate on the downline. Uh, thus giving us uh, options in terms of material in and out. Okay, so just kind of wrapping up there, uh, the kind of scope of the blockade works, uh, five point ends south and west of the junction, refurbishment of four point ends at the west junction, uh, and renewal of uh, approximately three kilometres of uh, plain line. In terms of the slab track itself, we'll be uh, removing approximately 10,000 tonnes of the existing concrete slab, uh, as I touched on, the uh, installation of the twin track pour, uh, we've got installation of four new units of S and C, uh, new drainage throughout, uh, and 4,000 metres of new rail. Uh, while we're doing that, uh, our, our kind of colleagues in the OLE department will be installing two kilometres of uh, conductor bar through the tunnel. We'll be uh, updating the, the platform throat, new platforms and extensions, uh, as well as all the kind of host of associated items, CCTV, uh, we've got uh, PAVA, new surfacing, etc. Okay, so finally, just some of the key facts. Uh, in this 20-week blockade, uh, the cost of the works is circa £60 million. Pounds. So, as you can imagine, quite a lot of money being spent on a daily basis. Uh, there are going to be more than half a million man-hours spent, 141 days of continuous working, and that will be 24-7. Uh, and that is essentially just to support the introduction of electrified services from December 2016. We will be operation, uh, sorry, maintaining the operation of the low-level station throughout this, and uh, there will be kind of access to and from the, the high-level concourse. And uh, as the final point there, there is a diversionary timetable will be in place. Okay, so any questions there? But I think we'll kind of catch those. And and thank you very much for listening.